Hello my friends, welcome back. I have returned from Ukraine and I was there for a week. We got a snowstorm, we got a storm of Russian Shahed drones, 75 to be exact to Kiev. 71 were destroyed but I didn't sleep because it was exploding everywhere. In every video I'll show you a very short segment about my insane adventures in Ukraine. But to not waste your time anymore, I'll give you a sneak peek of three of the biggest news that happened in the meantime. Finnish country has had enough. Simo Hauha has turned his other side in the grave and they have closed all border points with Russia. The Iron Curtain is forming again. The Russian army has announced a new sea drone, much like the Ukrainians have deployed their sea drones to push the Russian Black Sea fleet away from the Black Sea. The Russians now have caught up and announced their new sea drone. That is bad news for Ukraine. And finally, Poseidon has had enough. Since Ukrainian chief of intelligence Putalov's wife was poisoned, he made a deal with Poseidon to destroy Russian Black Sea coast. There was a huge storm that swept away Russian trench systems in Crimea. But now my friends, we'll talk about Finland because I really love the way my Nordic brothers are reacting to the Russian shenanigans on the border. Let's zoom in to the Finnish city of Turku. In this city, the Finnish decided to permanently close the Russian embassy. And not only that, they decided even to demolish the building. It hasn't been demolished yet, but the plans to demolish it are set. That means the Russian embassy will not be coming back to Turku, which means the Russian Finnish relationship is permanently damaged. Look at this long, beautiful border, 1000 kilometers of NATO border with Russia. Finland closed seven out of eight border points with Russia a few days ago, and the only one open was in the Murmansk area. This peninsula right here to Finland, a very northern, snowy, cold area, that was the only border point open. And Russia funneled migrants from Africa to that border point with bicycles on snow. You can see the footage right here. Poor migrants, man. They're coming from a very warm country, going into Russia. The Russian authorities are funneling them, tricking them to the Russian border with bicycles, saying that go, you cannot come back here. They were not allowed to retreat. Of course, the Finnish border guards were like, Perkele, ei vittu. They didn't let them through, so the migrants had nothing else to do than to hop on buses and go back to St. Petersburg. On this photo, you can actually see what the Russian state television aired in one of their propaganda shows of how do you get from St. Petersburg to Helsinki. Well, these two dots were connected by the route through Murmansk, a very long northern route, and it, you know, it, it looks like a huge massive schlong. This is what the Finnish are giving to Russians now. And I love the fact that the Russians aired it. In this video, you can see the graveyard of bicycles in the Murmansk Peninsula, close to the previously opened Russian Finnish border that is now closed. And are the migrants that were given Russian bicycles by a, a Russian bicycle company, they were bought by the Russian state from this company to be given to the migrants to be used as a migration weapon or a hybrid weapon to test the Finnish border guard readiness. Well, the Finnish were ready and closed the border and now the migrants didn't have any other choice than to just leave these bicycles because it's snowy and they cannot get to Finland, just leave the bicycles, hop onto the buses, go back to St. Petersburg. And now we have these heaps or piles of bicycles in Murmansk Peninsula. I mean, Putin is really playing with fire or to be more precise, he's playing with snow because if the snow, not if, but when the snow starts speaking Finnish again, Putin is Bergele. He's, he's done. My friends, the main thing I went to do in Ukraine is to accomplish the mission you made possible. So you donated in my last fundraiser 65,000 USD, which we used to buy 30 FPV kamikaze drones, the best and the newest drones, and one truck that we converted into an ambulance vehicle. In this video now you can see the delivering of these 30 FPV drones straight to the best Ukrainian Special Forces unit with the highest FPV drone kill ratio. Your money has been put into great use. Let's watch it.
My friends, we are here, you did it. In front of me is standing 50 kamikaze drones, first person view drones. These are the best and the newest drones Ukrainian military startup can produce. One of them costs 700 euros. And you guys have bought these drones to the best Ukrainian military unit, special forces unit there is. Their kill ratio with these drones is up to 50%, which is the highest. So you have directly influenced the outcome of this war. Some of these people who donated, I saw the statistics, donated 700 per person. So if you're watching, you might be behind one of these drones. And for Estonians, this is very notable because I always make this comparison. You don't see drones here. You might see one destroyed Ural truck, one destroyed Kamaz truck, one destroyed infantry fighting vehicle. Or, as I like to connect it, my grandfather was deported to Siberia in the 40s when he was four years old. He came back when he was eight years old. We Estonians, we remember what it's like to live under the Soviet occupation. I grew up with these stories, although I was born in 1996. Grandfather told me these stories. So in my eyes, these drones are making sure this never happens again in Estonia and never is going to happen again in Ukraine. And you who you donated, you are helping us achieve that purpose. You are helping us to our freedom. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraine! My friends, now the Russians have caught up or at least are trying to copy the Ukrainians. Ukrainian marine drones or sea drones. The program is about one year old because it started last fall and now it's fall again 2023. Well, the Russians saw how effective these cheap drones are in pushing away and destroying Russian Black Sea fleet. So they thought we also need these drones. And now they are presenting the first prototypes. And the Russian army and the reporters are promising that these will be handed over to the Russian Navy before the end of 2023. Now on video, these drones do look very capable. They have mounted automatic anti-air defense systems and machine guns on them. Everything looks nice, sleek and clean. Nothing bad to say about it. I cannot criticize these because they look dangerous and they look efficient. Now we are yet to see if they actually are only empty shells like the Armata tank, or it actually works. Both are possibilities. The first sea drones of the Russian army, unmanned boats can reach speeds of up to 80 kilometers per hour, carry explosives weighing up to 600 kilometers. Now 600, this is a mind-blowingly huge amount of explosives. Ukraine doesn't have any surface vessels that would require 600 kilograms of explosives. So this is obvious an overkill and can travel more than 200 kilometers, so most of the range of the Black Sea. At the same time, they can also work as an aerial drone or anti-drone platform. So they are all capable, as we can read. But I won't believe until I see their first missions, which I think we will see. Now, these drones can be a headache for the Ukrainians because the time in the Black Sea, at least, the time of huge outdated naval vessels is over. With cheap marine drones, you can push the Black Sea fleet into the ports and keep it trapped there. The Russians are trying to answer with the same with their drones now, but the little fact is that Ukraine doesn't have a navy like the Russians do. So what the Ukrainians can do with these drones is different. They can threaten Ukrainian grain exports because Ukraine has semi-successfully established a crane corridor with their own drones. Well, now the Russians are bringing out their drones without setting their Black Sea fleet in threat. They can threaten these civilian merchandise ships, which don't want to dock in Ukraine anymore, which will lessen Ukrainian profits from selling grain. So, unfortunately, these Russian sea drones have a potential to damage Ukrainian cash flows quite extensively. Time will show. My friends, Putin has signed the Russian budget for the next year and this is mind-blowing. We all talk about how Putin wants to bring Russia back into the Soviet era. Well, now he has really signed the budget to do so. A third of the entire money generated in Russia in 2024 will go to military spending. An entire third. This is insane. It's unfathomable. I think it's in the same level as North Korea. Close to it. Putin approved the increased expenditures on Russian army to a record since the Soviet era. About a third of the total expenses on healthcare and medicine will be reduced significantly. So healthcare 
and medicine and also education will suffer while the military gains. During the next year, the budget will spend 10 trillion rubles or 21 billion on national defense, 70% more than in 2023, 2.3 times more than in 2023 two and three times higher than the pre-war 2021 figures. The share of the military expenditures in the budget, which will total 36 trillion rubles or 411 billion USD, will reach 25.9% of the entire country's GDP. The USSR spent a third of its budget on defense in the last year of existence, thus into 1990s budget, 71 billion rubles out of 241 billion or 797 million USD went to military spending. In order to make ends meet, the government will cut down the expenditures to support the national economy. They will be reduced from 4.1 trillion to 3.8 trillion rubles. Financing of education and medicine will be frozen and in real terms taking inflation into account will be reduced. So. Putin has set the priorities for his rule. Military overall, education, healthcare and infrastructure, everything will be taken from these three big and poured into military expenditure. Of course, the pensions will drop also. Everything else will suffer in the country, much like it happened after the Soviet-Afghan war where everything started going downhill for the Soviet Union. One of the most active sectors where the Russians are pushing is still Avdivka. Russians have a clear-cut goal. They have a fixation on Avdivka, much like in Bahmut, and they are using similar tactics, pushing from Krasnokharivka from the north and Vadiana from the south. Now from the north, as you can see from the map, they have gained some territory, about one kilometer from their pre-offensive front line, they have gained this Terekon mountain. They're very close to the coal plant right here. Their goal is to cross this railroad and the embankment of it. They have done it in some locations, carrying huge losses. But now we'll go and watch a commander's report from Avdivka who is present there. So the third wave began more intensively, and this is evident in all the signs of their actions. It never ended at all, there was not a single day when their actions were not carried out. But now the intensity has increased, this means that they are running out of time. Can you tell us from your point of view which direction is the most dangerous? In which direction is the situation most difficult in terms of attempts to storm Avdivka? You see there is a threat from everywhere. They are now using the tactic of hitting one point and then another without weakening the attack. It's better not to say here exactly where and what is happening now. The point is Russians are now not only pushing from the north, from the south, they're pushing from everywhere, they're pushing every, every everything, every reserve, every tank they have into Avdivka to taking this because they also have a potential for it. I'm not claiming here that Ukraine will hold Avdivka until the very end. They will pull out because they are trying to save men but they're pulling out at the last moment possible to inflict as much losses to the enemy as possible, lessening their offensive capabilities. Avdivka's fate might be very similar to Pahmut's fate. Russians might occupy it in the end but at huge losses not being able to push anywhere after that for a long time again, like it happened in Bahmut. Now, my friends, we go to the Kherson area and the Dnipro Delta Islands. These islands right here are overall considered Ukrainian-influenced territory or they have direct Ukrainian positions on them. And Russians are still sending some of the troops to these islands. Everybody knows it's a suicide mission because the Russian FPV drone and artillery efficiency in this frontline area overall is very minimum compared to the Ukrainian ones. So I'm going to watch a video with you now with the Russian troops sent to liberate in their sense or occupy actually one of these islands again from the Ukrainians. Let's see their situation. And I'll remind you, these islands are mostly swamplands, uh, flooded usually all the time because it's surrounded in, with water on all sides. This is our hut, or rather what's left of it. We got flooded. So as you can see, this is um, swamplands or wetlands. It's very difficult to stay dry. Also, the reason why Russian Kherson front area is the weakest is that they're you know, the weakest troops, but also because it's such wetlands, there are minimum amounts of anti-personnel and anti-tank mines planted in this area, meaning that any Ukrainian armor or infantry pushing from any direction 
is not facing that huge difficulty. All sleeping spaces are underwater. Somehow guys manage to lay there. I don't give a about the drones because, because I don't. <laughs> so bad. Yesterday it was snowing. You know, this is the worst if it's like two, three degrees Celsius. So it is cold and it is snowing. That means the snow usually snows down and then melts immediately, which makes it into a very cold, the coldest wet water there is before freezing point. I mean, freezing minus degrees are much better because it's dry. There is no wetness, it's all dry. But this temperature, then the water is, it's, it's the worst because you will get sick, you will get cold. It's very hard to dry and get warm. And it, it's the, in my army days also, this was the worst. Minus 10 Celsius is much better than plus five Celsius. This is all we managed to save, most equipment underwater. There it is, the shore, awesome. <laughs> It's so bad, my friends. Where are you sending these guys, for real? I do feel a little bit for them because, you know, I was in the army also and these situations, whoever you are, like, they're just so miserable. Cold water, not being able to sleep and get dry. You become so miserable so fast, so, to assure death. These guys know they're gonna die here because they have nowhere to go. My friends, the snowstorm in Ukraine is now over, but two days ago when I was there, I saw that in Kiev also, but the front line situation is this, you can see. There was no attacks and no defense in this area in this time. Of course, many people commented that, that the Russians or the Ukrainians could use this snowstorm in their advantage because the enemy cannot see anything. Well, the truth was, my friends, that this storm was a freak storm. So big and so heavy that nothing, no tanks, no BTRs, and nothing could move through the snow. You cannot use this for your advantage. No drones are flying, no artillery can shoot, nothing can happen. This is that kind of storm. So nobody, no side could use this for their advantage because it was for everybody's disadvantage. That's how big it was. My friends, now we'll talk about something very serious. Budanov, the chief intelligence of Ukraine, his wife was, Mariana Budanova was poisoned by the Russians, of course, by the FSP. Now, she survived and she's in the hospital right now. I hopefully she will survive the entire treatment. Her treatment is going on. And she was poisoned through food in her everyday activities. But the thing is, we all know Budanov, we know his aura, his image, his meme lordiness online. So I think this was a big mistake by Putin to poison his wife because now it's, it's very personal. I wouldn't want to make it personal with Budanov. He's gonna go full John Wick on the Russian FSP and the command structure. Any Russian officer would be stupid not to be afraid now. Stay tuned for insane Ukrainian intelligence operations and extermination of Russian command structure in Ukraine and in Russia, in, in the Kremlin. This snowstorm was also connected to another storm on the sea. It was the storm of the century. I'm not kidding you. This high winds, we're talking 120 kilometers per hour, which were recorded, has not been seen in the Black Sea area and the southern Ukraine area for 100 years, a whole century. Now I'll we'll zoom into the Russian city of Sochi, which is a Russian coastal Black Sea city. I've been to that city actually. As you can see, this city very close to the Black Sea. There was not an earthquake in the Black Sea, but what you're seeing here is a tsunami. This storm was so big, the waves washed away everything close enough to the sea and which is not elevated, everything. This includes the Russian defensive structures, the whole Black Sea coast uh, of the Russian Federation is, is filled with defensive structures, especially Crimea. The Russians, local Russians report that these waves, which you can see on the video, washed away entire Russian Western Crimea defense systems. The trenches, the command posts, outposts, bunkers, everything was washed away and demolished. So the Russians now are obviously going to redig them, but it's difficult into winter and with the mud, it's, it's a bad time to dig them. And now memes are out that, yeah, Budanov's wife was poisoned and this is his payback. He talked to Poseidon, the god of the seas, and gave him a task to wash away the trenches. You know, this kind of meme, you know, Budanov and uh, Saluzny and then they give the hat to a wave and send it off to Sochi to destroy and to Crimea to destroy Russian defense systems. <laughs> My friends, if you want to be connected to what I did in Ukraine and stay tuned in the future also because I might be going to the United States and I'm going back to Ukraine and I'll upload everything, every small detail to my stories there and to my Instagram account. So go and check it out in the description below so you can follow because in YouTube I kind of make these videos while I'm away. So this way you can be connected what I do in the United States and in Ukraine. Also in the span of one week for the first time again, 
we'll do the Patreons, the butchering of the Patreon names, people who actually make it possible for me to help Ukraine because I feel this security net around me and I'm very thankful for you guys. Alan Binder, Regan Smitk, Purton, Sakari Konklin, Karl Bergenhem, Jochen R. Katherin. Thank you to these five people for being tier 10 and above. If you like my channel, you know what to do. Patreon link is in the description below. Until my next video, my friends, Slavo Ukraine, and bye-bye.